Welcome back, I'm That Chemist, and today we have a story where someone tried to cure their cold with chlorine dioxide. When I was in high school, we extracted metallic lead from something on a spoon over a Bunsen burner. We didn't get much lead, so I grabbed my pocket knife and a fishing sinker and shaved off some lead to add. The teacher was amazed and made everyone in the class look at how well our experiment worked. The teacher never figured out that something wasn't right, even though we had more lead than the reagents we started with. This is hilarious. Speaking of learning, and people doing things wrong, a lab on our campus had a high power laser for an instrument that needed to be aligned, and the same technician had been doing it for close to 20 years. At one point, he was training someone new to help out and continue when he retired. He had an incident that left the trainee with severe eye damage, so they were investigating and had a safety professional observing what he did to see what might have caused it. During the observation, the safety officer also suffered a severe eye injury with lasting impact. Apparently, the technician had been doing it incorrectly and unsafely for 20 years. This is so scary and terrible. In my mind, the safety person should have been able to prevent that from happening, and hopefully that campus has learned their lesson. Lasers are no joke. I may have been the buyer of that beryllium powder. It was 25 grams of it, and it was an extremely super fine powder offered by a seller called Lorem 274, and later as chem savers. I used a very small amount of it, less than 500 milligrams, to make a small and rather weak neutron source to test instrumentation a while back. They also had ridiculous quantities of thorium nitrate at the time, many kilograms of it, oh my gosh, from a lantern mantle factory in Illinois that they put in their own generic chemical bottles. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission got on their case about it because some buyers were caught doing some stupid stuff with it, like trying to make thorium metal and burning themselves with a violent chemical reaction while making a radioactive mess in the process. The radiation from thorium is rather weak by intensity, but is extremely penetrating and goes through an inch of lead like it's not even there. This is really scary, and you should not be buying anything radioactive or toxic on eBay. I hope you knew what you were doing, because even the beryllium itself sounds pretty dangerous. Hi TC, love the compilation videos, another Aussie with some stories here. First two are about Huntsman spiders. Do an image search for Australian spider with health bar to see one next to a window for a size reference. The first one's probably more physics related than chem. A few summers ago at night, when it had been raining, I was about to go to bed, but I heard something rustling on the floor near the kitchen door to the garage. Yes, you usually hear huntsman spiders before you can see them. I'm okay with them being outside, but I knew I wouldn't be able to sleep with it on the loose inside the house at night. After quickly dispatching it, I was met with an immediate horror, as literal thousands of baby spiders began to flow like a non-Newtonian fluid over the floor, up the walls, and behind the door. After it was over, my sister rang on the phone and I told her what had happened. Haha, <laughs> she did not appreciate the worst bedtime story ever. So if you're not sure what a huntsman spider looks like, this is what it looks like, and it is absolutely terrifying. You can see why this is such a nightmare. I hope you also managed to get rid of all the baby spiders, because that is terrible. The second story is from four years ago when I used to read water meters for the council. The meters are underground with plastic lids on top. Sometimes when you lift the lid, anything inside there will jump out at you. This time there was another huntsman spider, which jumped up at me. I yelled and jumped backwards and it disappeared, nowhere to be found. I figured it must have gone into the garden or something, so I got on with my job. Hours later, at the end of the day, I'm about to get back in my car, and who do I find tucked into the bottom of my pants? It's the Huntsman Spider, clinging onto me, all day walking around unaware of my little hitchhiking horror. It was outside. It had been polite by not biting me or climbing up further, so I let it go in a nearby garden. It would have been a different story if it had waited for me to be driving home, and if I discovered it by having it run across the windscreen in traffic, which has also happened to me before. It sounds like you're an absolute magnet for Huntsman Spiders. I'm sorry to hear that, man. About 25 years ago, we made, amongst other things, nitrocellulose in the backyard by submerging a cotton wad into 65% nitric and 98% sulfuric acid mixture. We even used an old gas mask from God knows where. At one point, the cotton began to rise from the nitrating solution and this was bad because it takes a little time before the wet cotton gets angry when exposed in air. My friend promptly used his fingers to resubmerge the cotton goo as he didn't have a stir rod nearby to do the job. His fingers turned yellow within 10 seconds and he rushed to the sink inside to wash. No harm sustained just his outer layer was turned into 246 trinitro finger. That's so funny. I would not recommend anybody nitrates their finger, but I would be interested to hear if any of you have your own nitration stories. One of my coworkers at my most recent employer was scaling up a benzylation reaction using benzyl bromide. If you're not sure what benzyl bromide is, it's a potent alkylating agent and it's also a tear gas. She was using a five liter glass reactor on the bench top. As the mix came to a reflux, the reactor operator began suffering eye irritation. Another coworker, the first had been her tech, then went into the small, poorly ventilated room where the reactor was to see what the problem was. She also suffered from severe eye irritation. Then, a third co-worker went in to shut off the reactor heating. All three spent the afternoon at the hospital. After an hour or so of eye washing, all returned to the lab with no permanent damage. As it turned out, the reactor head flange o-ring, a Teflon jacketed stainless steel spring, had not been properly seated when the head was clamped onto the reactor. 
allowing a mix of solvent, toluene I think, and benzyl bromide vapor to belch out into the lab. That is really scary, and I'm glad to hear that they didn't get any permanent damage. There's a couple reagents like this that I've worked with before, including propargyl bromide, where I've worked with it and thought, oh, it's not that bad. I'd read on Wikipedia that it's a lacrimator, but oh boy, it is that bad. It is much worse than I thought. Benzyl bromide is similar, although I've worked with other benzyl bromides and they weren't as severe, but as I've stated in an earlier compilation, benzyl bromides can be potent lacrimators, and they may not be tear gases, but if you have them on any surface and you accidentally get some onto a mucous membrane, you're going to have a bad time. Today's Yikes Awardee is Lunem. The x-ray diffractometer reminds me of a story my dad told me from the days he was a lab technician at a nuclear fuel fabrication plant. In one occasion, he had to handle some radioactive material in a fume cupboard. As a precaution against the radiation, he built a shield out of lead blocks to either side, over the top and in front of the material. He starts working with the material, and after a while, the health physicist comes running into the room with an alarm on his Geiger counter going haywire and wanting to discover the source of the elevated radiation levels. It turned out that my dad did not place lead shielding around the back of the radioactive materials, so the radiation was going straight through the fume cupboard and the wall behind it into the corridor next to the lab, and probably beyond. As the health physicist was passing by in the corridor during his usual monitoring rounds, he passed the inadvertent beam which set his monitor's alarm off. It just goes to show you that you have to consider everything even more carefully when working with radioactive materials, especially in terms of spatial and geometric orientation. It also shows how important health physicists can be to keep everyone who works with such materials safe. So this is a secondhand story that I heard from somebody who worked at a cyclotron. So there was an individual working at the cyclotron who has a reputation for creating problems. This individual isn't always the most concerned about the well-being of others. And on this one occasion, another individual, who I will refer to as Individual 2, took a pair of lab goggles that were not contaminated. They were in the clean goggle box and put them on and went about working their day. At the end of their day, as a part of their protocol, they had to check if there was any radioactive heat on the goggles. So they analyzed it, and it turned out that they had a radioactive isotope that was distinct from the ones they were working with. It was something that someone else had got on it. And so it turns out that person one, the person who created this problem, was the only person working with that isotope on that day. And so instead of putting it in the contaminated goggles pile, they put the contaminated goggles in the clean pile where this individual two, unbeknownst to them, took them and put them on and worked with that for the whole day. Was there likely any adverse side effects as a consequence of exposure? Probably not, but it just goes to show you that you always have to double check other people's work. And I think working in a cyclotron, I would definitely always check, especially if individual one was around. I've seen something kind of related to the battery explosion and equally terrifying. I was chilling with my friend at his brother's garage waiting for it to close up so we could use it to fix my car. One of the last customers to pull in was an older guy in a Zastava 1100, think Fiat 128 on steroids. He wanted his carburetor regulated or something, no big deal. The mechanic opened the hood and immediately ran away panicking. The older guy followed him, and they had a heated exchange outside. I got out to see what's what, and take a look at what's under the hood on the way. Turns out, the car had a liquid propane gas installation with the tank in place of the spare tire, which wouldn't have been that strange or scary if the space for the spare tire wasn't in the engine bay just over the hot engine which is where the tank, full of liquid propane gas, was sitting. Apparently, the guy had valid papers to prove that it was up to code and all, but he was told to seek service elsewhere nonetheless. Can't really blame the mechanic. Just remembering that makes me uncomfortable. I don't think it'd fare well in a head-on collision, or even a heat wave. The tank venting liquid propane gas due to excess pressure into a potentially hot engine bay isn't great either. Yeah, this sounds like a really sketchy thing to do, but I'm no mechanic, so what do I know? If you think this is a terrible idea, let me know down below. This is today's big story. The phosgene story reminds me of the CLO2 story in my family. My stepfather had bought a bottle of sodium chloride solution and a bottle of dilute hydrochloric acid because they had advertised it as a cure for everything to him. My mother suddenly called me at 5am because she said she suffered from shortness of breath and other lung symptoms after my stepfather had mixed the two solutions together the evening before. I asked her how much he mixed and she told me that it was only one drop. And also they, my mother and my brother, who also suffered symptoms as I found out later, opened the window immediately and didn't get too close to the mixture. As I roughly had a rough idea of the concentration that was in the bottle, I googled which concentration this stuff was usually sold at. I thought that they were probably just panicking and that's what caused the symptoms. So I advised them to calm down. During the day, I walked over to my parents' house and found a jar outside that clearly indicated that my stepfather had in fact not mixed one drop, but at least 50 milliliters of that stuff. Oh my gosh. That jar clearly contained an explosive concentration of chlorine dioxide. That is so scary. I got my gas mask and face shield and vented it into the wind. Had I known how much chlorine dioxide my stepfather had actually made, I would probably have advised my mother and brother to seek medical attention. 
That is so scary. Chlorine dioxide is no joke. People have advertised chlorine dioxide for the treatment of a certain disease, but it's absolute bogus. Does chlorine dioxide have specific applications? Yes, but cleaning out your lungs is not one of those applications. As an Australian, it's my time to shine. Hold my beer. It's not exactly chemistry related, but it does involve the same bullants mentioned in the last story. Once while I was playing in the backyard as a kid, I felt a tickling inside of my ear. Shortly later, it was followed by the loudest sound I've ever heard. It was like thunderclaps from a storm directly overhead, but non-stop over and over. It turns out one of the ants had decided to explore my ear, and I guess that sound was it poking at my eardrum. Luckily, both my parents had worked in remote outback Australia for many years and promptly put me in the bath and flooded my ear with water until the intruding wildlife was evicted. For the non-Australians out there, bull ants can get bigger than a yellow jacket and apparently have a worse bite slash sting. Although this one wasn't quite that big. I'd hate to think what would have happened if it had decided it wanted to fight. If you've never seen a picture of a bull ant before, I'll put one on screen now. These things are super scary, and you're lucky that it didn't bite your eardrum. Definitely an unpleasant experience. We have autoclave rooms for high pressure carbon monoxide chemistry in my company. In fact, we have one of these rooms on every level. Once, the carbon monoxide cylinder was empty, and the people in charge of changing them over had already left. So what do overly enthusiastic scientists do? They go downstairs, charge their autoclave with carbon monoxide, and bring the pressurized autoclave back upstairs without taking any safety measurements. Face palm. They could have started the reaction downstairs. One of my colleagues, soon to be Darwin Award nominee, was even more reckless and took this carbon monoxide bomb into the elevator because he didn't want to take the stairs. Thankfully nothing had happened, apart from disciplinary harm. Imagine the autoclave suddenly leaking. Yeah, bringing a big container of carbon monoxide around that could easily leak is not a good idea. I'm not sure why you would need carbon monoxide in an autoclave, and if you wanted to let us know why you use carbon monoxide in an autoclave, it'd be cool if you could share it with us down below. If you need instructions to open a can, you better stay away from chemical reagents forever. Chemical force. About hexafluoroantimonic acid packaging. I hope you've enjoyed this episode, and I hope you have a great day.